can just see it now. So. All right, everybody, it is 6 p.m. on Tuesday, September 7th, 2021. And we are meeting uh, in person at the Red Wing High School uh, pod in the J area at the high school. And I will call this meeting to order. All right, um, you're gonna have to bear with me because I'm so used to doing roll call. <laughs> Um, all board members are present except for Anna Ostendorf, who is unable to be with us this evening, and I believe Holly Power will be joining us momentarily. Um, I'll ask if we can all rise and join me in the saying of the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, Nikki Buck has agreed and offered to um, share our mission statement this evening. Do I turn my mic on then? No. Okay. Talk to this. Mission. The mission of the Redmond Public Schools is to educate and inspire all students as they realize their full potential and become respectful, responsible, and productive citizens. Thank you so much. Uh, the meeting agenda is listed out in your packet. Do we have any changes or additions to the agenda this evening? Motion to approve the agenda. Motion made by Jim. Do I have a second? I'll second. Sure. Second by Jennifer. Any other discussion? All right. Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. All right, so the first on our agenda this evening is the educational plan. So I'll just call your attention to that. It's in our board packet and it's also up on an easel here in our room. So it's always there as a reminder about what our core values are and uh, what we're striving to do every single day in the Red Wing Public Schools. The next item on our agenda is recognition and upcoming events. Does anybody have anything they'd like to share today? Yeah, Pam, if I could uh, uh, mention that uh, I regret to inform uh, you that Jana Langhans, a sophomore at Red Wing uh, Public Schools, died over the weekend. Uh, she's from Lake City, but had a full role here. Um, and so we regret her loss. Of course, her family's in our thoughts. Thank you, Carson. It's hard to begin a school year on such a somber note, and uh, our, our thoughts, of course, are with that family and for those students and other members of our community who are struggling um, in any way, shape, or form. Please know that you have a, a wonderful community here who cares about you, and all you have to do is reach out, and there will be lots of people that will be able to support you. So I just encourage you, if you're a student or a parent or a community member who's ever having a difficult time, um, we've got many, many resources at your, disposable, at your disposal here, and we just encourage you, um, implore you to reach out anytime. Thank you. Other recognitions or upcoming events? First, how the first day of school went? First day of school today. Happy New Year. That's exciting. Um, and I will um, say kudos to all of our athletes. Um, they're well underway in their sports this year already, so that's awesome. Uh, soccer and ball, middle school volleyball and tennis are all going on right now. So that's exciting. I've seen runners going by, so that's pretty exciting. Um, and so it, it's just a great feeling to see our kids in the building laughing and being together on the courts and um, cheering one another on on their field. So uh, a little bit of a normal feeling, which is great to feel and see and experience. The other piece that I just want to um, take a moment is to say thank you to our community members, to our school uh, community, um, to our, my fellow board members. We've had a really rough 18 or so months. Um, we've had to have some really difficult conversations. 
We've had to make some really difficult decisions. I know those aren't going away, but I just wanted to say thank you for taking the time, the energy. I know it's it's paid a huge price at the people at this table, but also I know in our district, anyone who's tied to our district as a staff member, a teacher, a student, a parent, a guardian, it's been rough. And I am super excited um, to begin a new school year um, with some semblance of, of uh, normalcy. Um, and so thank you. And I'm excited about the new year. The other piece that I want to say is that in our difficult decisions, we haven't always agreed. Um, and that's OK. I've appreciated the dialogue that we've had. It's come to me in many ways, and I thank you for that. Um, at the end of the day, if whatever our vote is, I know that regardless of the vote, we're always 7-0 in terms of supporting our district and the decisions that are made at this table. And we stand as a united front, and I thank you all for those that effort. Um, and I look forward to even learning more from each other and having res respectable dialogue um, and moving together through this school year. So thank you. Any other recognitions or coming events? Seeing none, uh, the next order on our agenda is public comment, and I don't believe I have received any public comment this evening. I don't have either. the superintendent. So then we get to go on to um, COVID related topics. Uh, first of all, we have some uh, COVID data uh, shared with the board. It was updated just today uh, because we get uh, numbers from county at the beginning of each week. So you'll see that in every board packet. Um, and it's always updated, um, you know, the day of the board meeting. So uh, do you have any questions about that data sheet that, that I shared in the packet? The data that's provided by the county, is that still two weeks behind or is that more current? Yeah, it's uh, behind uh, for some of the data points. So for example, the uh, CDC metric, uh, that's used for a lot of a lot of different things uh, gets processed through the county and then we receive it on one monday but the cdc has already posted you know the next version so we are a little bit behind uh, in terms of sharing the data so two weeks in Florida? one or so two weeks that's not true. Okay. yeah so it shows good trend lines but it may or may not be the, the latest greatest thing I will say that you know information about um, you know how many kids are isolated or quarantined that should be up to date as of you know today for example. So uh, we've had uh, some discussion about a face covering policy. Of course, this time uh, we had to, to go it alone in terms of developing our own policy. Uh, we weren't able to rely on the, the school board association or the state in terms of exactly what the face covering policy looks like. So don't be surprised if you see this topic um, quite frequently over the next uh, few weeks or months uh, as we learn some of the nuances. Uh, one of the big areas of concern uh, that we noticed uh, has to do with student athletics. Uh, right now, we're the only school in the Big Nine that requires our athletes to wear masks indoors, like for athletic competitions. Um, and uh, currently, we um, allow spec uh, not to wear masks. It's recommended, but not required. So we have concerns about both of those things. And um, what we'd like to recommend today is to allow our student athletes and other competitors not to be wearing uh, their face masks while they're actually playing. So if they're playing, they won't be wearing a face mask. If they're sitting on the bench, they would be wearing face masks. And then we're asking that spectators, including people who go to athletic events, would also uh, be uh, required to wear face coverings. Uh, that really, that issue really surfaced recently uh, because we didn't change the policy, then we could have kids at the event all, you know, close to each other uh, without masks on, even though during the day they're required to wear masks. And so that raised some concerns for us that you know, we wanted to start requiring spectators to wear masks. 
Um, also, uh, we'd like to uh, provide some um, options uh, for administrators to make exceptions uh, to the face covering policy because the seven board members and I can't anticipate every single possibility that might be out there. And there are some cases when I think it's obvious that we would not require face coverings and we don't want to wait two weeks until the next board meeting. And so we did include that as a recommendation in, in changing policy 808. The, um, the next item uh, has to do with uh, criteria and timing for revoking of the face coverings policy. Uh, that was brought up uh, you know, to me to bring something back to the board. And so you can see the recommendation that's included in the board packet. Uh, what we'd like to do is use the uh, CDC uh, metric uh, in terms of high, substantial, moderate, or low uh, transmission uh, in the county. Uh, we talked about all sorts of different metrics. If we want to look at uh, vaccination rates or positivity rates, you know, those kinds of things. But we all kind of coalesced on using that particular metric to decide when we have to wear masks and when we can take them off. You'll notice that the biggest recommendation is not to jump back and forth week by week, um, you know, because some of this data fluctuates and it can change as, you know, data is refined uh, with time. And so our suggestion is that if, um, if there are three weeks in the, the low or moderate uh, category, three consecutive weeks, weeks then we could uh, not require uh, masks. Uh, and then once we're at that level, then we'd need three weeks to go back into to wearing masks. So at least that's a recommendation. You know, we're open to suggestions from uh, school board members, and we can always come back with another uh, refinement. Um, also, I'd like to add that I think it would be prudent to review the face covering policy and uh, the criteria for taking on uh, or taking off or putting on masks, perhaps at the second meeting of every month, just to make sure you know if there are questions, if there are some changes that to be to be made. So at least once a month, we would uh, review those two documents. And that's all I have in terms of those two issues. So what I'd like to um, suggest um, is if we could still put our names in the queue um, for when we have a comment that worked really well, we monitor that. Um, and that just will help with the dialogue. Because I don't want to miss people who might be on the end. So Jennifer. it looks like Mr. Bryant. No, Jennifer's first. Jennifer, go ahead. Thank um, you. Carson, I was just wondering how involved the COVID response team was in putting these uh, uh, this together. This, these Both of these make a lot of sense to me. I, I like uh, the work that's put into it, but I'm just wondering how involved they were in Sean that was helping with it. And in terms of the face covering policy, <coughs> excuse me, uh, the, the primary involved were the high school administration, uh, the COVID response team, uh, Don Weider and myself. Uh, the reason we chose the high school administrative team is because of the impact on athletics, especially spectators and student athletes. So that's why they were picked to be part of that group. So the, doc, the, the policy changes reflect their or our recommendations in terms of face coverings. Uh, with regard to the criteria, I know I talked to, to Shonda briefly uh, about it early on, uh, but really the recommendation comes uh, from the COVID response team itself. And so I changed you know, the, the formatting, some of the wording, but it's, it's consistent with what they recommended. Uh, Mr. Bryant. Thank you. Going back to these two documents, the COVID data 2021.09.04, proposal that you have um, just trying to see how they tie together and and uh, I'm, not, I'm struggling figuring out how to do that because you have uh, projected two-week case rate cases per 10,000 CDC projected seven-day case rate um, so <clears throat> is there a way to put them up with what we're actually seeing um, instead of projected, 
we're going all the way back to 814 projected. So we should have, according to your um, comments, that's two weeks lag time. So we should have numbers, realistic numbers, um, going forward instead of projected. And we're going by what is determined versus projected. I'm just trying to figure out um, which which way we want to go. I, I like the idea that we have some type of criteria in place, but it's just confusing how you get to it. Yeah, and uh, I can answer that if you uh, looking at the, the COVID data sheet. Um, I highlighted in gray the metric that um, that we were planning to use. And so you see, for example, uh, for the period ending September 4th, you can see that the projected seven-day case rate is 259. So that would be in the high category. I understand. And so that's the category we would use. Uh, I think your question all has to do with, well, projection versus actual, you know, probably. Correct. Uh, those numbers are, are generally uh, very close to one another. So I think we could, you know, use a projection and still be able to make some determinations. So we will look, maybe I'm being picky here, but projected versus actual are really two different meanings. So we're gonna use this, we're gonna use this, how does they, you know, projected is one thing and yeah, okay, they're pretty close. Um, maybe you need a projected, you need an actual. From going two weeks past, you know what the actual one is, and projected to go in the next two weeks going forward, because we know probably on 814 what wasn't projected, there's an actual number as there is on 821. Maybe that can just be added. Yeah, have to have something, happens. instead of just using, oh, we think it's gonna, basically we're saying, we think it's gonna be this, so we're gonna do this based upon what we think. I'd rather have more concrete points. Yeah, I know sure. that uh, last spring, for example, uh, we would get the projections, and then in most cases, they were adjusted by the time everything goes through the process, and so there would be some slight differences. And so we'd update those as we went. Um, I can talk to, to Shonda and Joni, um, you know, who, who work with our county to, to see if we can add a row that CDC's actual seven day case rate, you know, something like that. And it's gonna be, you know, a month ago, we should know, or the 14th, which was what, 20 some days ago, 30 some. 20 some days ago, we know what that number is because right. it's two weeks past. Mm -hmm. so. yeah, I can, I'll check with them to see you know, how we can change the. Thank thing. you. And you're next. Then Thank Arlen, you. then Holly. I see that. So, one of the things that I discussed um, with the superintendent prior was the change from athletes wearing masks to spectators wearing masks and I'm all for not masking our athletes I think it's it's dangerous and if we're the only ones in the big nine that are you know how do you enforce that and, you know with students coming here and it's awkward and then and it's just I, I like that it's the same however I, I'm I'm struggling to really understand um, what I'd like to see is maybe do it by season. So right now, the only indoor sport we have is volleyball. We do not pack a gymnasium filled with people for a volleyball game. There's also swimming. And swimming. There's plenty of, plenty of space for spectators to spread out. Um, the temperature in the, the, the pool is super high. And then to add another mask on it is super stressful for spectators. So I'm just I'm I'm just throwing out there the idea that maybe we think about it per facility or um, the same thing with hockey. When we get to hockey, our arena is ginormous. We can spread out, sit, you know, at close contact. We have this. Um, Definition of close contact, six feet for 15 minutes or more. We can spread out in our gymnasium and in our hockey arena 
six feet or more. So, you know, I, I guess I just, we don't have to decide that now, but I really wish that there was more thought going into that. Um, because last week or the last time we met, it was okay for spectators to not be wearing masks, but now it's not okay. So I, all of a sudden it's changed and it's not like we're closer to our students. Yeah, I know that um, the IS Paul, uh, Paul Hartman, Activities Director, uh, which one it would be easier to enforce, masks or social distancing? His gut reaction was that it would be easier to enforce masks rather than making sure people were at least three or six feet apart. Uh, but I, I, I or we hear what you're saying, um, you know, especially when you have Viking stadiums filled with 65,000 fans. It's essentially an indoor facility, you know, with big doors. Um, you know, and yet we uh, we can socially distance in our gym and other areas, and yet we're requiring masks. So, uh, you know, another issue had to do with you know kids, you know, who'd be at those events as spectators, uh, and so we have some concerns about that. Um, obviously, it's a it's an optional thing if they go watch a game or a match. Uh, but we thought it was uh, prudent to at least recommend that report. So I'm just going to talk about behavioral things for a minute. In the, in the mind of a kid, you're in a mask all day long at school, and I'm going to go home, and do I really want to come back and cheer on my, my friends and wear a mask for another two or three hours? Um, I think a lot of kids are going to say, you know what, I don't. And I think we want to encourage kids to be together in our buildings where we can keep an eye on them and supervise. And it also promotes unity and community. Uh, I'm just throwing it out there as food for thought. I know most of you probably don't agree with me, and that's okay. I just, I just, I struggle with two weeks ago it was okay for spectators to come because, you know, the argument was it's their choice to come. And so they're putting themselves at, at their own risk. And now all of a sudden, it's not that it, the whole argument has changed. So I guess I'm, I'm just confused and a little bit frustrated that, you know, the last time we had this conversation, it was very different. Yeah, you, and I don't know why it has to be one or the other. Right. I don't know why it made a difference. Yeah, and you expressed the, the reason why the original recommendation was to recommend not require masks you know, for indoor uh, events. Yeah. Well, and, so, and I'll be the first to tell you, I would much rather wear a mask than to watch my kids struggling running down the, the court trying to wear a mask. Um, I'll, I'll take the hit any day if, if that's the choice, but it just doesn't make logical sense to me that we had it one way and now we're flipping it. The argument is still the same. It's their choice. They don't have to attend. Um, so they're putting themselves at risk if they choose to attend. Plus, we're adults. We know how to socially distance. Anyway, that is my two cents. All right, you're next in the queue. Thank you. Um, got some things to say, but first, if I want to address the mask and spectators activities. Um, I had concerns when we passed the mask mandate two weeks ago or whatever about that. I said it didn't make sense to me that we were not requiring a mask for the spectators. But at the time with everything going on, I chose not to push the issue at that time. It was essential, in my opinion, to get a mask mandate put through on the school. That was what was on the table and tried, instead of trying to amend it. So I fully believe that we should at this time require a mask on all spectators in our buildings. Uh, the argument that they're six feet distance or could be, well, we're six feet distance here at this meeting here too. Pick and choose when is it six feet, when is it, everything else doesn't work. So in my opinion, if we're going to have a mask mandate, we need to follow it that way. Now, the other part of it is, though, so does it make sense for us to require our students participating in Minnesota State High School League activities to be doing different than any other school and those coming into our school. Last year, masks were required on the players 
in the Minnesota State High School League rules. And I personally think it would be much simpler to follow Minnesota State High School League rules of regarding masking indoors and outdoors on the school activity. I have to be part of that. But we do control the spectator and I'm 100% behind requiring masking for now on all spectators in our building for sports. Pam, up some valid points. We got time to go and study that more before the winter season, sports season. Uh, if we come up with a good way that we can determine when people are six feet socially distanced, when I'd certainly be open to talking about it. What I find, uh, enough on that now, what I find confusing here is uh, county COVID numbers and our proposed criteria for timelines removing face coverings. And the criteria here is based on new cases per 10,000 persons in the past seven days. And part of the confusion for me, and I assume for many people, is last year when we saw the COVID numbers, they were for 14 days per 10,000 people. So we're, we're thinking about numbers from a year ago and this and, and it's, it's confusing, but I, for me, I simplified it real easily when I looked here. If we're looking at high transmissions uh, and it's new cases per 10, 100,000 people in the past seven days, the low end of what, 100. That low end of 100 really converts into 20 based on last year. What you're gonna have to do is take the 100 and about double it to 200. So you got 14 days worth. And then you got to divide it by 10 to get back down to 10,000. And that gets you a number similar to what it was last year. Now there's going to be variations from week to week, but if, if you have two weeks of the same thing and you're only using one of those weeks, you're going to get this number for 100,000. So um, we're, I like that we have a criteria here. Um, I'm going back to last year's numbers if we could get the 14 day 10,000 number down to 20, would I be okay getting rid of the mass right then and there? And I think I maybe could. So I, I'm okay with working this number up or down a little bit to maybe, but I, I'm glad we got something here to look at right now. We, we shouldn't have to fight this battle every time at a board meeting. Let's get a criteria out there. Let's use it and let's go with it. Uh, um, I'm glad, personally glad that we went through the mass mandate uh, at our last meeting. Um, I think I'm glad we are finally getting the criteria out here to work with. Are these the right numbers or aren't they for when we come back for removing the face coverings? It's close. To me, I would be open to looking at a little bit higher number, but but uh, like I say, it's extremely confusing because I'm trying to use last year's numbers and convert that into this chart. Once I finally got that thing figured out, how to get to the numbers we were using last year, um, you know, we were major concerns at 40 and 50 for 10,000 for two weeks. And right here now, a high transmission is anything 100 on 10, 100,000, which is, what if I'm doing my math right, 20 per 10,000 for two weeks. Uh, and at that point, we were feeling really good about the way that COVID was going on the direction it was. We've been on that swing, we need to get back. So I ran it on way too long. Uh, like I say, I will support this. Uh, criteria, but I think it should be looked at. I think we should look at the masking indoor for other things in our district too. If we can social distance, that's a good winter project or get to or whatever. But we got to act today for what we can do now. I think we should mask all spectators indoors currently, and we should follow state high school league rules of masking on all our students that are participating. Thank you. So, what I'm hearing you saying though is make the math equal to what we've been using in the past. Equal for who? I mean, comparing apples to apples. 
Like it's hard to look at this chart because it's so different than the charts we've used in the past. I'm going to get to something compared similar to what we had last right. year or get that in, just have everybody get it in their mind. What are we actually looking at? The same map. In comparison. So yeah. do, and you can't do an exact conversion because the numbers vary every week. But I got a very good average number for myself to use on COVID count for a two week period. Uh, the only drawback of it is that's two week old data by the time we got it last year. And to address Jim's concern on projected, I thought the projected numbers were county using more current numbers projecting out and trying to get ahead of that two week delay is what we were doing last year. Whether that's in this stuff we're getting with the county now, I don't know. But last year, the projected number was using current numbers, but not waiting for the state or whoever to put out their numbers that were two weeks old. It was giving us a heads up ahead of time. Holly, Holly go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm with you, Arlen. When we made the decision at the last week, I was I had like, well, wait a minute, we just said everybody else has to wear a mask, except for the people that come into the building at night. It made no sense to me. So I'm glad we're readdressing it, and I'm glad that we're having an honest conversation about numbers and about case rates. But what we haven't mentioned is the Delta variant. It's much more transmissible to children than the variant we were dealing with last year. So, I don't know if we can compare apples to apples because we're dealing with a whole new strain of the virus. And that is not something to <coughs> that we would look at how we did it last year. I would prefer to go with the COVID team's push and recommendation for how we look at it this year. If the if the you know strain was the exact same and we were dealing with COVID, whatever it was last year, that's different, but we're not. So if the COVID team is recommending that we move in a different direction in terms of looking at what's high, what's medium, what's low, I don't know if that's part of the factoring. I'm just assuming it is. So maybe we can get some clarification on why they want it that way instead of us agreeing to change it into something without understanding. Because personally, when we started school last year, we were still quite hesitant about what it could turn into. Well, we have now seen what it can turn into. And I would hate for us to make a decision based on how we did it last year for this year. So I'm all for supporting what the COVID team recommends, but with a deeper understanding of what that actually means in terms of why they're looking at. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Can you address that right now? Yeah, the, um, and I, I said this uh, last spring too, uh, and I think it expresses the frustration that all of us are sharing, not only in this room, but everywhere. Uh, the numbers are completely arbitrary and subjective. So uh, and that goes with the COVID rates last year, you know, because we're using those rates to determine if we should be in person or hybrid or online only. And I think the same is true for CDC's uh, metrics, you know, this time around too. I mean, you know, when it comes down to it, we really don't know what an acceptable positivity rate is, for example, or what uh, uh, an acceptable uh, seven day case rate is, you know, uh, for the county, and we just don't know. And so uh, I know the COVID uh, response team looked at really rely on, on the metrics that the CDC is using, uh, which are twofold. It's a seven day case rate uh, per 100,000 people, and then also the positivity rate. <clears throat> there are pluses and minuses to both, but again, they're both completely arbitrary. You know, there is no right answer. Um, you know, so the, the COVID response team, you know, looked at those four different categories and then, you know, came forth with the recommendation. So Thank I you. wish I wish I knew we had the right answer, but you know, it's just it's impossible to really know for sure. Uh, if I could just add one more thing, I'm jumping ahead of Jim. Um, but um, you know, the one concern I have about the criteria is was expressed by I think a parent in the district or somebody who sent us an email, you know, recently. And you know, when will it be low enough? 
to take off our masks. You know, if we follow this criteria for the next year or two, are we always going to be wearing masks? Well, I sure hope that's not the case. You know, and so that's why I think we should review this criteria. Regardless of what we decide tonight, we should review the criteria and timeline and see what other schools are doing, look at the school transmissions, and then adjust this as we go. Uh, because I think we've only been, you know, only twice or something, you know, under the rate of high you know, by a period of time. So anyway, sorry, uh, Jim, I didn't mean to, to jump in the front of you. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just, uh, I'm not a med doctor or am I in the medical field, but I think the flu of 1918 is here forever. I think as a society, we are going to probably looking at having some type of COVID around the rest of many of our lives. So we're learning about it, trying to figure it out. It's, and my my estimation, that's just a guess, is never going to go away as long as I'm around. Secondly, you mentioned the other school districts in Big Nine, no other athletes in indoor events are masked while participating, I believe. Correct. What do you know what the other school districts are doing regarding their participants or spectators? I don't know that offhand. That's something we could bring back to another meeting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a little hard because I mean to me I I get the idea, you know, you know, we're gonna make mask our students, but everybody else not sitting there. Walking in the door, you know, COVID leaves at 3:15. Or what else coming in can go without the mask? I don't. I, but I get the. I just assume not ever, anybody wear a mask, and everybody's smart enough to stay away from each other, which I think people are starting to smart up. Uh, but to me, it looks like two so a week ago we met. It's like eight days ago. We put that in with the understanding: of spectators, no masks, recommended, not required. Students now required. We're flip flopping it, meaning, well, we got to have somebody's got to wear a mask. Let's make the participants wear a mask, not the athletes. So it just doesn't seem even right, whatever we decide tonight, it's even it's the right thing. I, I totally agree with stu students uh, that the, the participants in whatever high school league thing that they're participating in uh, not have a mask, or you know, they're going to wear it when they go to other schools then, because we require it. Other schools get required to wear it here. So, don't know if there's a, a definite best answer but or best solution tonight, but we got one of And by the way, if I could uh, add one thing, uh, uh, the one thing that's happened uh, in the meantime, uh, from when we originally came up with the policy to now, is what happened in Albert Lee, uh, where they uh, did not require masks. Uh, they started school earlier than we did, and they're. Um, at least a week ago, there were over 40 kids who tested positive for COVID. There were over 300 who were quarantined. And so uh, I think that gets to Holly's point in terms of this Delta by, uh, uh, variant and how it spreads. And so I think that caused us to, to reflect on what our policy was. I'm not saying it's right or wrong. It's really the board to say whatever the board uh, wants to do. But I know that was a factor. Yeah, if I could go back to this proposed criteria of timelines for removing face covering requirements. Uh, doing the math in my head, and I, uh, so I'm, I'm trying to get back to last year's numbers. And for phase one, phase two, and phase three. I'm just that one greater than 10 um, 10 times 2 is 20 by 10 gives you last year's case rate of 2 for a 7 or a 14 day case rate comparable to a 2 last year and a 14 day case rate for 10,000 to me that seems very very low on the high end of that moderate transmission age range there's 50 times 2 is 100 to get to two weeks worth of transmission. Divided by 10 gives you 10. So somewhere between 
two and ten using last year's criteria, fourteen day per ten thousand case rate is what that moderate transmission is. But that's picking numbers, but I, I like the criteria, but I think that we're a little bit over. I would like to see the mask come off a little bit earlier, if that's the right word. So maybe you get one as high, phase two substantial, and phase three moderate, and forget the low. Oh, yeah. Moderate would be phase one, is what I'm looking at. Uh, as the, 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 the suggested criteria says, when the county drops down, our policy is written exactly what you're describing. So, oh. you know, if we're at high now, if we're in my position for three consecutive weeks, then then we, we move down a phase. It wasn't clear on here where phase one, phase two, and phase three were. It only said that related to phase one when the county drops down to low transmission which is zero to them and yeah, then the elementary kids will down. drop down to phase one so to me that's phase one so phase one phase two and phase three even in the moderate phase one is in low so i'm trying to run the number up and we're in a high transfer phase three already when we're at the substantial so i'm a little confused on those phases uh, to describe it, I've written. Um, or phrase. Um, um, there's an easy way for us to describe it. You know, I could certainly talk to to Ann Robertson to see if she could work it in a different way. Um, really, I could, you know, the uh, moderate transmission is is essentially phase two. Low transmission. So if we got low transmission, no, well, that's the problem. And for three weeks, uh, we were. Substantial or the same thing. Right, as far as masking. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. So low and moderate's the same. No, low low's got phase one, phase two is moderate, phase three is substantial and high. Right. That's a that's relevant. And I would agree with Arlen on that it's confusing because you have four transmission levels we're going through phase. Well we could do say uh four substantial transmission. Yeah. You know, well, if you're okay with I, these numbers, I would suggest the phase after what you the highest transmission and say phase Oh, I don't think there should be any, but that's that's my number, way I'm out of my numbers. So. Yeah, I think uh, we but that would get it instead of having two different tables, put combine the name and the both of them. Higher substantial transmission and then put the phases there. Well, and Arlen, are you suggesting that with moderate transmission we would go to phase one? So basically, there would only be two phases. That's that's my gut right now tonight, suggesting phase one on moderate, phase two substantial, phase three high, and no phase on low. Okay. If, if to me, if my numbers, if I'm working it right, nobody's disputed me how I'm trying to translate to last year's numbers. If we're down to two cases in the county over the last 14 days, or per two cases per 10,000 over the last 14 days in the county, I, I think we're, I don't know if we've ever hit that low. Well, right, and, and we I were think without masks when we threw the masks away here back this summer. And I think we're still higher than that. Well, what I appreciate is the word you used earlier of flexibility, because we also have to look at this realistically. We're never going to be zero. I think you're right. This is going to be here for a long time. So are we really going to expect 
a zero number. No, but we're going to know over time where our numbers are and what is a realistic expectation. So I think this is a great starting point, but I think we are going to have to keep looking at this. Um, I think we should, whether we have an in-depth discussion on it or not every meeting, it should always be on our agenda, just like COVID was all last year, because there will be things that we're going to have to bring up and discuss and change and be flexible about um, and realistic about. We don't know what the, the realistic expectations are going to be in six months, yeah. in six weeks. Okay. So I would really appreciate it if it could always be on the agenda. If we don't have anything to say, fine, but let's, I think. All right, Jennifer, you're next, and then Holly. Um, I was just going to say that uh, the substantial and high transmission rate is when it is recommended by Goodhue County CDC to have masking indoors at all times. Below that, um, it's not, they're saying that it's not necessarily necessary within buildings. So I agree with Arlen that I think we could probably go, maybe not tonight, but eventually um, look at having no masks for moderate and low transmission um, based on that. Um, but definitely masking in all the buildings, substantial and high. That would simplify the plan a little bit just to have the two phases rather than have three. Um, but for now, I do think that this is a good plan, something to start with. And as everyone has said, if we continue discussing this monthly, um, we can come up with something better. And it, it, COVID is always changing. And so we need to be able to be flexible and change things along with it. And I think that our changing our plan for athletic events shows that we can be flexible and do that based on the needs. Um, it's looking like we do not need to have our athletes masked, and I agree with that. Um, but our athletic director um, and others on the team are asking that the spectators are masked um, so that they do not have to worry about social distancing there and for the safety of the students and for the spectators. And also, it just makes our policy, I think, more concrete and cohesive, as Ireland said, if we're doing it during the day. This is our policy in our school buildings all the time. Um, and so I agree with that change. And two weeks ago, we had other things to discuss. So, you know, it makes sense to me that we bring it up now as we um, have more information and are looking into it. So I agree with um, both of these changes in the policy. Oh, thank you. Um, I concur, Jennifer, and that's all I'm going to say about that. Now, last time when we met, we talked about when we were going to revisit it, and it was going to be done at the agenda committee, and then you were going to bring it and put it on the board agenda, was my understanding. Well, we talked about bringing the report back to this meeting. Right, that, from the, the agenda committee we report. Were, the last board meeting we had, we talked about bringing a report back and we didn't have this information at the gym no but we as far as revisiting it oh, oh you guys were going to revisit it at the agenda committee meetings going and then forward. and then moving forward you were going to have something ready for us to discuss at the board meetings so is that still something i know, think this will have to be something we discuss pretty much every time we meet right so we, and that's what we had kind of decided yeah. was that every agenda committee meeting you were going to discuss it, bring right. new information or old inf or whatever kind of information yeah. to the board. So, um, saying that we need to discuss it every meeting is yes, because we've already discussed that we're going to do it at the agenda meetings and bring it to the board. It's kind of what I wanted to remind us because that's what we're already doing. Okay. This was not ready at the last agenda meeting. Okay. So, but going forward, maybe we'll. I, now I got you. Going forward, not a, I thought you were saying at the last meeting we come up with this. Why is your question tonight? No. Okay. Right. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I think the my assumption, you know, depending on the agenda committee meeting, would be I'll just assume that we're going to be talking about these issues at every meeting, mm -hmm. and then you know we just kind of go from there. That's the easiest. So it'd be the learning plan, which would include quarantining, uh, policy to wait, and then the criteria. So it'd be very easy for me to, to rework this 
combine a couple of things, maybe even give you a couple options. I hate doing that because it complicates things, but you know, that might help with you know streamlining discussion. I think as a board, we're all gonna want to know where we're fall each schedule board meeting, where these numbers fall. Oh yeah. So yeah, it's gonna be a the conversation at every future board meeting for some time. Yeah, it was in basically in response to the notion that we spend so much time talking about this when we have other things we should be discussing. My feeling is yes, we do have other things we need to be discussing and this. So if we get it all organized and streamlined, we're ready and roll. Yep. We'll do. Well noted. All right, so looking for a motion then. There's a recommendation on page eleven of our board book. So the recommendation is to approve changes to policy 808 as presented and to adopt the criteria and timing for revoking the face coverings policy as presented. Moved by Holly. Do I have a second? I will second. Uh, Jennifer seconds. Any other discussion? Just oh, okay. Um, I am going to have a hard time. I guess first I want to have a clarification trying to read through that policy. What are the changes before we make the motion or be, make the vote? I would rather see, and I don't know the motion's on the floor, but I'd rather see something that we follow state high school league rules for our athletes and that unmasking. And we'll just take that variable out. But there's a motion on the floor. We either vote it up or down. I don't want to try an amendment or anything else. I'm just putting that out there. Why can't we try them? Well, it gets very complicated, but that's fine. People can do what they want. I just am not really in favor. I got to look at that 808 again to see what it says like how we're getting ready to vote here. But, uh, and the other one, the criteria, if we're the for taking mask off, doesn't seem to be in alignment with, I know with me and maybe with others on when we finally can take the mask off and what the number is. So I'm just putting that out there. And we may have to go and, and revisit that with another vote at another meeting. And is it really needed to have that removal of the mass policy done at this meeting or could it go in the next meeting? I'm just putting those thoughts out. I'll vote accordingly when I'm ready at the time. Uh, so to separate it into two? Is it what? too late to separate it into two? Just uh, uh, discussion first. Um, Missile High School League is what he talks about it, but I have no idea what it is. What does Missile High School League recommends for their student participants? Yeah, I don't know. They do not require masks. Okay, they don't require. Masks. So the and so the the, the motion to, to uh, change the masking from participants, spectators in the stands wear them, and athletes do not. Is that part of the motion? Yes or no? Yes. <laughs> And if we wanted to that per the Minnesota State High School League I don't know. I'm not, I'm not going to say that because I don't know what it is, and I'm not going to guess that. Uh, and then um, if I could, if you don't mind, if I could respond to uh, Arlen. Uh, the red line version of policy changes, I believe, is included as an attachment. So you can kind of see what the recommended changes are. And then in terms of the criteria, it would not have to be approved tonight because it would be impossible for us to have three consecutive, you know, uh, readings in a different level before the next board meeting. So it doesn't have to be tonight. Uh, motions on the table, you know, but how do we like to handle this? Too? So amendment would be to amend the. Amendment could uh, could be as only take out those two specific things. So that's what an amendment would be. Just prove it the way it is. Oh, but you want to you prove the way it is, and you're proving the, the, the 808 policy yep. that were submitted. there. we're not sure. We need to do that. So can we change the motion to the amend the motion? It, amend the motion to have it be. To approve the changes to policy 808 and then have it be a separate motion for the criteria and timing so that if we don't have to vote on all of that at once. I think it would be best on the amendment to specific 
amend what part of it, and then vote on the amendment, and then vote on the amended motion. So what you're meaning is, if you don't want to approve the, the policy, you only do those two things tonight. You can do that and bring the policy back at another meeting, the rest of the policy. But that's what the, the so wishes of So if I were to have. amend it? You amend the motion to say, as effective immediately, the students go without student athletes indoors, don't need to wear it while participating, but on the bench they do, and spectators need to wear it. That's what you're, you're talking about, right? Yep. Jennifer? And it's combined with the. But then there's other parts of the 808 that we may not want to finalize tonight. I don't know. But what the, you want to do. the criteria is not part of the 808. When you right. Right. The criteria and timing for results in the state coverage, that's not part of 808. We're not going to. The only other, right, that's not part of that. So We'll never get three weeks. With two weeks from now, we'll never have three weeks. To, we could set it. What you all talked about as to phase one, two, or three, move those into a better box so we all understand it at the next meeting right. because we won't have three weeks of high, substantial, moderate. Before next week. Sure. Before because the only other thing on policy 808 is deleting the or adding the last component of that. Is that correct? Or right, as far as the exceptions. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Another and option, I'm certainly not an expert when it comes around the rules of order. You know, I'm sure there's a provision where you can split, you know, a motion into two. I don't know what the ground rules are for that. Another possibility is just uh if Perhaps if both just withdrew the motion and then we considered a different motion, that's probably not perfectly consistent with Robert's rules of order. Or we can just take a vote on this, and if it if it doesn't doesn't pass, as long as we agree that we can take up each one separately, then we should be okay. You know, the goal is to, to get a consensus of the board. You know, to make sure that we're giving everyone the opportunity. I would like to withdraw the motion. Okay, and start fresh. Are you starting with me? I'm okay with that. Because right. you were a second on that motion. Okay. And I don't know if it matters, but my Chromebook died, and so I'm trying to get into this one. So I'm not online, but since we're all here, I don't know if it matters. Just so you know, I'm not on the screen. Right. So but can we can hear you. Oh, you're, Thank you're, you. You're taking a minute, so it should be noticed. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We're crystal clear on this now. <laughs> we're crystal clear that we're going to get here. And the second has withdrawn, agreed to withdraw. So it's open again for any motion. Okay, so I'm looking for a motion on how we'd like to proceed. Jennifer made a suggestion, which I think is a good one. So I got I can make the motion um, that we approve the changes to policy 808 as presented. I'll second that. Isn't that just the original motion? No, it oh, was okay. just the All right. I just want to make sure we're not. No, it's different. Okay. All right. I just want to make sure. Can you repeat that, Jennifer, please? <coughs> um, I would like to approve the changes to policy 808 as presented. Motion made by Jennifer, seconded by Holly. Any other discussion? We're just 808. Yes, Arlen. Clarify for me, does that mean the spectators will not will be wearing masks and that activity or athletes will not? Yeah. Thank you. I've been trying to try trying to sort my way through this mess and well the reason we 808 because it's approved and working and I don't, so anyway, that's fine. I got clarity. I'm good. Thank you. All right. Any other discussion? Questions? Right. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed, aye. All right. Now, do we want to tackle the criteria and timing for revoking the case coverings? Yeah, if it's okay with the group, I'd like to, to check with this uh, COVID response team and we'll come up with a different recommendation on two weeks from now. All right. So that let's, we'll just leave that. Let's discuss it to some a little bit at the agenda meeting. At, what number tower suggested. Okay. Anything else on COVID related topics? Get rid of the mask as soon as we can. School board reports is the next item on our agenda. Uh, 
does the finance committee have anything to share? The finance committee met at the end of August. Um, the same day we updated. Wasn't that wasn't that our last meeting? Right. So there's nothing new to report. No. It's got the report that's in there. Yes. Yes. We refer to it? the board packet. I have it. Anything else you'd like to highlight on that? No. No. Okay. Operations committee. Anything to highlight? We uh, our meeting was uh, canceled for this evening. The last meeting was early August, and there was you've already reported on that. Okay. Personnel committee, we did have, um, you will see our notes are in the board packet as well. Um, we did meet this evening uh, just before the board meeting um, to discuss a specific, um, we, we reviewed the hiring process um, that goes through our human resource program in light of a specific position that we are hiring for, so we, we reviewed um, the procedure on how that worked, and you will see more about that in two weeks at the next board meeting because there will be a recommendation coming forward, more than likely, for a hiring position. But we wanted to make sure we we're following the procedures because that is something that we have tasked the superintendent with is to make sure we're following the procedures. Um, and so we reviewed that, uh, and it, it's fine. Yes. Um, can I add to that? For sure. Okay, great. I wasn't able to attend the personnel committee meeting for an emergency reason. Um, therefore, I haven't gotten the nuts and bolts of what was discussed. So I'm not going to say whether or not I agree that something will come forward or something won't come forward, because I don't know. That's all I'm going to say about that. Okay. Fair. Yeah. Uh, Legislative and Policy Committee? Uh, we haven't met for a while. Uh, we had a meeting after our last meeting, so and we worked on some policies, uh, approved some stuff at the previous meeting there, and uh, so nothing. But I know, do you remember it? No, I think we delivered what we had to discuss okay. at the last meeting. Uh, negotiations. We have a very, very busy September coming up. We've got a lot of meetings scheduled. Um, we're well underway, and you should be hearing from us shortly on hopefully some tentative agreements. So that's exciting. Anything else? Yeah. I have the GCED okay. update. It's yeah. kind of a big one, so bear with me. Okay. Uh, Sherry just sent it to us today for this evening. Um, as of right now, we have 120 students enrolled in Five Rivers Online. Um, Ten of those students are part-time and the rest are full-time students. The board, the GCED board, approved opening up Five Rivers Online to outside districts. Meaning, if we do not fill up within Good and County Ed District, we can take applicants from outside the district. Um, those people that would opt to come into Five Rivers, say Bloomington or Owatonna, 100% of their ADM follows them. So that was the reason we went forward with approving that piece to allowing other kids. The concern was would they take a space from a child or an adolescent who from Red Wing or from Cannon wanted to have that space. Um, not likely, possible, but then we discussed at the board we would have to look at um, numbers for teachers and if we had to add a teacher to make room for more kids, that's a very viable option. So it doesn't strictly eliminate students from enrolling, but it gives us an option if, they need, if we need to look at hiring another teacher to keep class sizes functional and kids able to get their needs met. Does anybody have any questions about that? Can I just yes. add, all three of my kids are with Five Rivers. Um, the one it's taking, because we got her enrolled later, she's half and half. She'll do two of her honors classes here, and she'll do the rest um, with Five Rivers. Um, you know, we're just kind of, we're just being patient, going with the flow, and just kind of, but we had 
wonderful reviews from my children and I because wrapped up in the health industry they always in a pain clinic you know they ask you rate your pain one to ten so I use that one to ten scale for everything I go on a scale of one to ten one being the worst ten being the best what did you think about your first day of five rivers both of my kids that fully attended today because my one didn't get to because we're scheduling her classes right now they rated it they both rated it at an eight I said okay what would you have rated your in-person school experience before the one rated it a six the son my son the youngest one rated it a three we had really and i was blown away by and just we're just kind of learning as it goes but i really think that this five rivers and i like the fact that we're opening up to this might be something that we can really grab a hold on to and run with to be different from everybody else. So I was really, even I'm excited about school, and we all know how I felt about school beforehand, <laughs> you know, and so this completely changed. So that's why change is good, change is good. We just need to be able to, um, and it's scary at, at first, but as long as we remain calm and patient, everything will be okay. And, you know, we might end up liking something better than what we thought we would. So I just wanted to give that just a really good um, evaluation of Five Rivers from our perspective with three kids in there. And three different, so we've got elementary, middle, and then high school. So that was our perspective. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So a little bit more. Um, Jackie attended the meeting as well. Um, the as the business managers report, we're closing in on the fiscal year 21 and preparing for the audit and our and the cash flow over there is solid for fiscal year 22. Mm -hmm. Yep, it's in a solid place. That's one thing. Um, MDE has encouraged districts to use their ESSER 3 funds, the three or two? Three. Three, their ESSER 3 funds to help students recoup lost learning skills or lost learning time. And I don't know if we budgeted that in our work here in Red Wing. It's not a have to, it was a recommendation. But I seem to recall some of, some of the summer boost money was used for students and did students with IEPs attend summer boost? Do we know? I, I, did I'm students with IEPs attend summer boost? Uh, it was in conjunction with ESY, so I'm sure there were different circumstances depending on their IEP. Okay. Um, the MDE Department of Ed is also expecting every student with an IEP to have an IEP meeting before December 1st. This is extremely uncommon, but it's happening because schools want to give families a clear picture of where their child is in terms of learning gains or learning loss and what needs to be made up or how they would make that up or what would the plan be moving forward. Typically, if you have 20 kids on your caseload, you would have 20 IEP meetings for the year. Now they will have 40 or 50, depending on if the IEP meeting is December 1st and they're their IEP meetings within two weeks of that, you wouldn't have to do that one twice. So it wouldn't exactly be double, but it will be a lot more work for the special ed staff. And I'm not saying it's work sh that shouldn't happen, it should happen, but just to be mindful of that as we're talking about special education. Yes, Jim. Can you for the audience out listening define what IEP means for them? And then yes. you said some other S Y or something. Oh, sorry. What, what yes. those IEPs mean is, for people? For people who have a child with um, special needs or, or disability, it's an individualized education plan. Thank you. Yes, thank you. And ESY is on that IEP, if you look at what their goals are and what they should accomplish for the year, if those goals could be impacted in any way by loss of time in the summer, then the case manager and the team qualifies them for ESY, which is extended school year. So they get that extra time in the summer. That's why people out there listening. Yep. No, I think it's great. Yeah, I think it's great. We, we're so used to throwing acronyms around here that it's kind of nice just to share them. Um, Thank you. Yeah. And Jackie, was there anything else? There's, oh, we passed the mask mandate for um, the school 
and it was kind of contentious because some people did not want to have a mask mandate over there and some people recognized that they're in Red Wing and it would make sense to do what Red Wing is doing because we're so close and because the population of students that are served over there are at a much higher risk for catching something or having immunocompromised situations or fighting infections. So the board approved it, I think it was 5-1. Yep, 5-1 to have a mask mandate over there to, and to follow what Red Wing does in terms of how we move forward. Um, there was one member who was not comfortable with the vaccination information and GCED pushing the language of people should get vaccinated. It's recommended. So instead of having that in the language of what we were adding, it's just a resource. If you want to know what CDC is advising on vaccinations, it's in this resource, it's just a link, but it's not GCED pushing what that message is about vaccinations because people were very sensitive to that, which I thought was a you know good compromise. And they're gonna continue to review data just like we do at our meetings. And I think that's it, Jackie, isn't it? Uh, the only other thing on Sherry's update you didn't mention was the strategic plan. Oh, yes, yeah, there was the strategic plan was um, worked on this summer. Were you part of that, Kirsten? It was. Okay, so they're going to work on developing interventions in school districts to help students stay off of an IEP. So if a child's having trouble in any area of math, reading, um, writing, behavioral challenges, any of those things, schools throughout Good New County Ed are going to be working on improving their intervention or their strategies to work with kids who are struggling so that they don't end up on an IEP. Right now there's a big gap. There's lots of things going on in the classrooms and there's lots of moving parts, but sometimes we miss a piece for kids and they end up going to special education and it might not be the case. So we have a higher disproportionate number of students who are African-American on IEPs in Goodhue County, and that really needs to be looked at. And so this is one of the ways that Goodhue County Ed District has taken an initiative to really look at how we're working with kids in the school buildings to keep them there and to work with them in a way that they're successful instead of looking at from a deficit model. They can't, they won't, they aren't. What can they do? How can we help them do that better? So I like that. Um, being better at communicating is, um, what's her name? Don't tell me. Anne Robertson, is she gonna be working with them at all or strictly ours? Uh, currently it's strictly ours, but of course if there's some programs at GCD that are directly related to our works, so there may be some stories there. Okay. And then the other thing was annual onboarding of new staff. So right now, all of the administrators in all of Goodyear County have gotten the same onboarding training from GCED, which I highly recommend anybody sit in on. And then moving forward, just new staff. But it was like a start fresh this summer with introducing, especially with Five Rivers coming to the table. So it was a big, long meeting. Any questions? No, but I really appreciate the thorough update that's great to know what they're doing yeah Thank it you. was it was nice to move some things in the right direction awesome are there any other uh committees to report on all right seeing none administrative reports superintendent anderson i'll touch upon a few of the topics in the report uh, professional development week uh, was outstanding i think it was the best week of training uh, that we've had here perhaps forever uh, and was highlighted by some presenters who really focused on equity. Uh, Jess will uh, give a presentation uh, here in a couple of weeks and so I won't go into details. Uh, she can explain uh, that later. Homecoming starts on September 13th and so we're thrilled that we can get back to some sense of normalcy, albeit with masks, but a uh, full range of activities starting on Monday so we're excited about offering that. High school will be posting some of this information as far as what's happening when. 
uh, very soon. It's not, it wasn't posted as of this morning because they're making some final adjustments, but uh, you'll like the, the schedule. Uh, there's no doubt. Veterans Day program. Uh, for many years, we've been able to host the annual Veterans Day program. Uh, when asked earlier in August uh, about this program, we did have a mask requirement. I really didn't want over a thousand kids in our gym along with maybe 200 uh, visitors unmasked. And so at that time I said, no, it won't work out after this November. Of course, now we have face coverings uh, that are required. So I think it is uh, a possibility if we can do some good social distancing. And uh, so Kristen Bray did reach out uh, to uh, the group that sponsored that. And uh, we'll either have it here in the high school or it'll be at the armory. So they're working on some of those details, but I wanted to give you an update about uh, that. Uh, another item has to do with the open forum that we're going to have here uh, at the end of September. And I just want to make sure that we're all on the same page. I'm assuming that the sole topic for discussion during the forum uh, relates to planned use of Jefferson School. We have a conflict already because the minutes show September 27th, and your report says September 20th. Oh, my fault. It should be the 27th. Yeah, thank you. Uh, that's the workshop, the night of the workshop. So we'll have this open forum, and then we'll we'll talk about some workshop topics. Uh, so it sounds, I can tell from everyone's reaction that that's kind of where I'll think of that. I just want to be sure. Uh, every hand joined uh, will be become part of youth outreach. Uh, that uh, is either official now or will be uh, within the next few days. And so uh, they'll be taking over a lot of the work uh, in terms of parent engagement, uh, data mark work, and, and those kinds of things. So I just wanted to, to let you know about that. If you want Youth Outreach to come to give a presentation, uh, we can certainly do so so that we can better understand their mission and goals. Um, as I was reading through that, could you expound a little bit on parent permission and what Youth Outreach is going to be? Looking towards? Yeah, um, so uh, we have the data mart uh, that's always been housed by every hand joined in the past. Now it will be under the umbrella of youth outreach, uh, but I think we have a good umbrella. Uh, we, uh, even though it's under the umbrella of youth outreach, i3Works is the one who's controlling the data. Uh, i3Works is a consulting company that does technology work uh, for the school district and in the past for every hand joined, and now they're helping out youth outreach. So that data mart is going to be controlled by i3Works. Uh, youth Outreach will be just like the other community partners, uh, like the Prairie Island Indian Community, Hispanic Outreach, uh, and some others. And so they'll still need to get the parent authorization forms so they can access data about the students they serve. <laughs> so I think that's a really good arrangement. I was really concerned at first because you don't want one group acting in two different roles. Mm -hmm. So that's why I3 works will control the data mark. Okay. Did that answer your question? Yes. Here? Okay, mm -hmm. good. The um, Community Education Recreation Fall brochure uh, has been issued and it's included as an extra uh, for the meeting tonight. And then we did uh, conduct our at least yearly consultation with our non-public schools uh, to go over a variety of things like nursing services, transportation, uh, title allotments, and those kind of things. And, uh, it's a good reminder that we're all on the same team. We all want all of our kids to succeed. Uh, and so it's nice to, to work with them. They do great work, and I think we're good partners. That's all I have. Can we just uh, revisit that time on the, the open forum about Jefferson School? We discussed six to seven, and then have the workshop following that. Is that correct? Yes, and, and I'm assuming that there'll be a tour before the six o'clock start. And so I'm thinking maybe around 5.30 if community members want to walk through the building just to familiarize themselves with what it looks like. Uh, and then we'll have the 6 o'clock meeting uh, that'll last probably about 45 minutes so we have a little break before the board meeting or before the board workshop. And we're going to have that at Jefferson? That's the plan. Okay. And is that going to be listed out somewhere like maybe on our website, the school website or, you know, like a link to that, like for the agenda that night so the public can know? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it'll be posted uh, as an open forum along with, you know, the location and what we're planning to discuss. Okay. 
Any questions for the superintendent on his report? All right, the next item is the consent agenda. There are a lot of things listed under the consent agenda with the minutes, the claims, new hires, resignations, retirements, activity advisors, MOUs, leases, and extracurricular assignments. Does anybody have anything they'd like to pull or change from the consent agenda? I have one question under activity advisors, number 11, so I'll pull that. Anything else? Well, I guess I got a question on the MOU on Mr. Myers. I was going to ask for that same one. We should yeah. pull that one. So yeah, let's just eight. discuss that one there because that kind of, you know. Okay, any others? Did that yeah. MOU pull include all three staff? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, yep. Thank you. Okay, so we will vote on the consent agenda minus number eight and number 11. Do I have a motion? I'll move it. Arlen made the motion to approve the consent agenda minus numbers eight and 11. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Holly. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? All right, the consent agenda carries. All right, let's discuss number eight, the MOUs. And yeah, there are three uh, MOUs with employees uh, that are recommended. Uh, two of them are for uh, previous uh, teachers of the, dis the district, uh, Brittany Keel and uh, Jill Rohan. Uh, they both take in administrative positions, uh, Brittany in Red Wing, uh, and as an early childhood uh, director, and then Jill Rohan for the Dubuque County and District as a coordinator for two other school districts. So uh, what we've done in the past is that we have typically allowed uh, teachers, uh, as per their contract, to put in for up to a three-year extended leave of absence. And they both requested the full three years um, if it's going to a different role uh, within a school district. So we would not allow uh, one of them to be, or, or a teacher to, to get an extended leave of absence to be a teacher in Brooklyn Center, for example. It's another teaching position. Uh, but we have allowed it in the past for administrative positions. And so I thought it would be prudent to at least memorialize that in, a, in an actual memorandum of understanding with a clear indication that it's not setting past practice. And so everyone has to agree to that. So that's for the two. Uh, Dan Mars had put in for uh, an extended leave of absence this past spring, I believe, or early summer. I can't remember the exact timing. Uh, he had a, a change. Uh, of heart in terms of what he's planning to do. And so he accepted a uh, position uh, in another school district, and uh, or in a GCD actually, uh, as a K-12 music teacher. And so uh, the recommendation is to approve the MOU, uh, or to approve the MOU that would enable him to return uh, if he so chooses. So my, my, my question on Buckley is, I didn't take time to look back, and I could be mistaken here. I thought he, he, he did a leave of absence because he's going into another field. That has changed then because Correct. he's now going to, he's not quite going to another school district, but he's going to a school, a, a, a school organization that has ties to Red not, which is unusual. Yeah, yeah, through GCD, and uh, and that's the the reason for the MOU is yeah. that first it's, it's the situation's different than what was originally planned, and it felt like to us that it was a very unique circumstances. You know, we're right in the middle of COVID, people are changing their plans. Uh, GCD really needed a K twelve music teacher. They posted, couldn't find anyone. You know, Dan was available. Uh, and so we thought those circumstances 
made it unique. Uh, and again, we don't want to open the door to everyone to just try out a different teaching position elsewhere. That would be a mistake. Uh, but I thought we thought that they were very unique circumstances in this case. Did you, you listed past practice as a um, concern, and the other two I'm going to use is that spelled out it specifically? Is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I don't. I'd rather yeah just talk about it than have to pull. I'd rather. Oh yeah. No, this yeah. makes good sense. Yeah, and so when we voted on this at GCEV, on uh, their new teachers, those three people popped up that they were pulling in and I asked at the meeting how it came about, but I didn't know that Red Wing in past practice had done that for people going into an administrative position. Um, is is Mr. Mars is a one year or a three year? Two year. Yeah, two year. Two years. Two years? <laughs> back. Yeah. So he, he could not come back before that two year period. Uh, but if we approve this MOU, then he could come back after two years okay. and still, you know, maintain some of his seniority rights and those kinds of things. Okay. And so, the reason there, for the MOU, it's in the teacher's contract that they have this up to three years if they, they, they compete, go to a competing school district or another school district, they go there, they waive there. Right. Chance to come back. Right, exactly. So they will not use needed for that. I get that. Yeah, if, um, let's say if Dan had uh, taken a job in, again, Brooklyn Center, he's as an example, then we would not be recommending this. Uh, but in this case, it's helping out our strategic partner at GCED. It actually, he will actually be working with Red Wing students mostly. And so that's uh, helped explain the exception. Okay. And we, and that position of his has been filled. Correct. The one that he vacated. Right. Yeah. Right. So it didn't leave us in a position of oh. Correct. Correct. Yeah. That was kind of my big. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Uh -huh. All right. Anything else on number eight? No. Should we vote on that first before we move? Sure. I make a motion to do uh, number eight for three MOUs. Second. Any other discussion? All those in favor, say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? All right, that motion carries. I just had a question on number 11. I'm looking at the activities advisors. That's the sheet, by the way. Yes, it is kind of buried in there. It's right before 104. Um, the only thing I, I have a question about. So we just hired a communications director, brand spanking new to the district in terms of um, creating that position. And then I look at the student newspaper advisor, and I'm just wondering, I, I, would it ever make sense to have a communications director be in charge of that or no? I mean, is it completely different? Can I answer this? Yeah, I caught the error on here when I opened it up. Um, our communications person is in that role, and it is part of her job description. So, so that I, I kind of thought so. So that's why I'm, I brought the question up. So then, the activities person, where we can delete that line then. Yep, it's the same person. Right. So yep. they're not getting paid an extra twenty one forty. Mm -hmm. Correct. So it's absorbed it's, in it's, there. It inclu was included in the job description for the communication. Which I thought did. Yeah. So I, that's why I was confused. Okay, good. So I just emailed uh, two gals on that. Okay, thank you. Yes, Arlen. I thought that was in the job description that it was. They would do that, but it was an extra pay besides. But they would fill that position. I did not take it that way, but if I'm wrong, that's fine. I like that idea. Yeah, the way the budget was presented was that, that it would absorb that stipend. Okay. Because it's part of the job. Okay. So good. we're voting to approve this without that person in that position. Correct. So we'll have to strike the student Somebody newspaper to make a advisor. Motion, that way. So I'll look for a motion then to um, accept the activities advisors minus the student newspaper advisor. I'll make that motion. Do I have a second? Second. 
such an effect question. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? All right. Those in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? All right. Thank you. Thanks for clarifying that. All right. Donations and grants. There are three donations from Jeannie Eilers for $50 for the uh, Summer Food Service. Uh, youth Outreach for $450 for Mental Health Matters Seminar. And the Mental Health Coalition of Goodview County uh, for the same uh, Mental Health uh, Matters Seminar. And, uh, once again, we appreciate uh, the donations uh, to serve our students. Madam Chair, I'll make a motion to approve the three donations with a comment. Yes, sir. I was second. Oh, did you say second? Good, go for it. <laughs> Motion made by Jim, seconded by Jennifer. Your comments, sir. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, for some of us that have been here a long time, Mr. Derricks, uh, Dick Beach was a, was a teacher and coach here in Derry High School for a number of years. And Holly might have remembered him too. Maybe Jennifer? Nikki? Nope. Okay. Mm -hmm. I want to stretch it too far now. <laughs> but uh, it's very nice that uh, the summer food in honor of Mr. Beach. And the other two, uh, uh, Mental Health Matters Seminar with our Miss Minnesota Red Wing graduate. Kelly. So thank you very much for those generous donations. Mm -hmm. And because it's a resolution, we do have to take a roll call vote um, to approve that. So I will begin with uh, Ms. Tower. Aye. Ms. Tipped? Aye. Mr. Bryant? Aye. Mr. Derricks? Aye. Uh, Ms. Buck? Aye. Chair votes aye. That passes 6-0. All right. Review of first day of school. Mr. I'll just Harris. briefly go over uh, some of the issues, and uh, I'll be available for questions. We'll start at the high school. Of course, um, uh, Mr. Zeminich uh, expressed that it was a rocky start because of Janet Depp. So, um, there are some other, uh, the biggest issues at the high school included uh, some technology issues because this is the first time that the kids uh, were issued uh, Chromebooks at school on a school day. So I know there were long lines, there were a lot of people who thought they were going to get a new Chromebook even though they had an old Chromebook at home, you know, those kinds of things. Uh, we also are implementing a new schedule at the high school and there are two new schedules one for seventh and eighth graders and one for the others so there were a lot of questions about that that would happen in any year uh, and so i know they're sorting through that uh, and then of course uh, we with isaac Mansick's uh, resignation because he took a different job uh, we are short an assistant principal for now hopefully that'll uh, take care of itself in a couple of weeks but uh, right now, it's uh, George and Jay who are overseeing, you know, the whole high school, uh, which has over a thousand kids, so it's quite the task. Uh, so, like uh, George said, it was a it was a rocky start, but I, um, you know, he's very confident in, in how things will will sort out here. Uh, and so am I. Uh, elementary schools, I think, went uh, really well uh, in terms of. Uh, kind of the structure of having the K-6 schools, three of them. School attendance zones, uh, in the end, worked out fine. Uh, I know there are a lot of parents uh, who had to make other arrangements because they might live in one school attendance zone, whereas their ex-spouse lives in a different one, or maybe their daycare is, and so they have to juggle some arrangements there. Uh, but almost every child showed up at the right school. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're really worried about, to be honest with you. Because uh, that can be really hard on, on the kids if they have to be transported somewhere else. Uh, that leads me to transportation. Um, I've lost a lot of sleep over the last couple of weeks, um, waiting to see what would transpire. And it went much, much better uh, than I thought. Uh, Terry Johnson explained that it was a typical first day experience. Even though we completely changed our transportation, we took Jefferson out, we have a two tier system, we use starting and ending times. Uh, so, you know, obviously there were buses late, but we get that every year. And uh, they're making adjustments to the schedule. Uh, they're also hoping to relieve some of the 
the crowding on the Burnside buses. So I think they'll be shifting some kids around. I'm sure you, you'll hear about that uh, in terms of what buses they take and the time for pickup and those kinds of things. So in, in a nutshell, those are, are some of the significant issues that we've experienced. Our principals, however, wanted me to make sure um, to share that it was a great day. So the kids were excited to be here, you know, at all levels. You know, I was at um, uh, Sunnyside and Twin Bluff uh, today, and you, you know, they were wearing masks, but you could tell that they were happy to be there. They're excited to see their teachers, and that's what we want. So do you have any questions about the first day or anything related? Hey, Brian. What, maybe a, what, two questions, really. Uh, maybe more of a comment. What, what time does, does GCED start their school? Day. Oh, I don't know. Is it early? Yeah, it's early. It's uh, right before eight, maybe. Is, it's closer to our elementary time. Do GCED, GCED kids ride their regular buses? Yes. Okay. I saw a bus coming up into the high school at 745 this morning thinking, what the elementary was starting earlier, but then they might have been dropping somebody off at GC. Yeah, they're, they, I think they run uh, a couple of their own routes, mm -hmm. you know, general ed routes and special ed routes. Uh, but sometimes we share students, and I think that's what Jeff and I, I didn't expect a bus to be going up towards the high school at 745, and I'm coming up 21. Yeah, they'd be the River Bluff. Going out to the middle school and the Sunnyside and Burnside, and then coming up later. So, okay, that could be it. Yeah, and again with transportation, I don't know if you've read the, the newspapers, but mm -hmm. Stillwater, for example, um, has uh, a lot of struggles because they're 20 routes down uh, because they just don't have enough drivers. St. Paul. St. Paul has 76 issues. drivers short. Wow. Uh, in Minneapolis, I know had issues. So uh, thankfully, uh, for students provided enough drivers. Uh, it was not an easy transition, but for this year, it was probably a smart move to have a two-tier system. Hopefully, we can look at that this fall for the following year, you know, see if we could possibly go back to something different. But uh, we didn't have the, the same troubles that a lot of really reputable uh, school districts have had with transportation. Okay. Any other questions? Or? Yeah, I do. It was a great day in Red Wing. <laughs> A lot of great first day pictures out there on social media. It's lovely to see. Way to go. Esther, three funds. Jackie. Oh, right. Uh, so in your packet, you have um, both a summary of the community needs assessment that uh, Jeff Whitcomb prepared, and then the itemized spending plan for the, not, the part of our ESSER 3 budget that is not reserved for learning recovery. So when Holly mentioned that we should reserve some for the special ed learning recovery, that's another piece of the budget that uh, isn't presented tonight. That's the uh, 421,000 that's reserved uh, for that purpose, not just for special ed, but for all students yeah. for learning recovery. Um, the plan was, or the, the requirements of this were different than ESSERS 1 and 2. There were strict guidelines we had to follow in order to apply for the funds. The first one was to have a um, public comment on our return to in-person learning plan. We did that in June, um, followed up by meetings with community members on what our needs were. And that was uh, what Jess did in July. And then we put a budget together, um, which we're presenting for your review tonight. Uh, we'll finish up the application and get it submitted to the Department of Ed for final approval here in uh, it's through the 1st of October. So I'll just ask, are there any questions? Can you explain the cafeteria cameras for me? Um, I can. Go ahead. Uh, the uh, of course, uh, th these are for the high school, and the concern is that kids are not wearing masks when they're eating. Of course, they're at, you know, tables, and so the concern is if there was somebody with uh, COVID at one of the tables, uh, we would like to notify uh, kids at that table. Uh, they don't have to quarantine because uh, we don't have that at high school level, but we thought we would at least owe it to the parents and the kids so that they knew that at least at their table or somebody with COVID. 
Uh, it was a struggle last year to identify who those people are uh, because kids aren't going to remember who they sat at lunch with two days earlier. Um, and so the recommendation from high school was actually to add some cameras so that we can easily identify kids so that we can do the, the contact, the voluntary contact tracing. So those will be recorded and kept for a while? Yeah, just like all of our uh, uh, security footage. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so the thinking is that if there is an issue at one of the tables, somebody has it, then the high school admin will review the table to identify who the kids are and then let our COVID team follow the parents. And again, it's, it's a voluntary thing, uh, but we do encourage uh, parents to really closely monitor for symptoms of COVID because you know, if they have the symptoms, then they have to stay home. But it's a voluntary quarantine if they're just exposed. I'm also curious about the mental health well at work. Is that to pay for like a mental health professional there? Okay. Yes. Um, awesome. Uh, yeah. If approved, we can uh, contact health partners too. Okay. Arlen, you're in queue. Yeah, I, I guess I'm looking for a little clarification. We got. For the 21-22 school year for Five Rivers Online, $350,000, and for 22-23, another $300,000. Is my understanding Five Rivers Online should be able to run on its own with the revenues that we bring in on the students that are going into it? So I'm a little confused why all of a sudden this is going to cost us $650,000 over the next two years. Uh, it's a way to, to pay for that service. So we're still getting the money. And so if you just look at Five Rivers Online, the goal is to have the revenue uh, pay for the expenses, uh, but by including the, the allocation that will that will help the general fund. Yeah. Well, I, so, I'm still confused because if it's gonna come in from the students, what are you using ESSER money for? ESSER money, are we gonna get the ESSER money back then when the students pay for it from their tuition, what we get from the state? And the, okay. Can I take a stab at it? Yeah, sure. <laughs> looking for a good stab. <laughs> All right. So GCED as an entity cannot receive general education aid. So any students attending Five Rivers Online, the general education aid will go to their resident district, like Red Wing, like a normal general education student. Then um, when the year is said and done, GCED is going to look at, okay, how many students attended from which districts and divvy up the costs. So we're reserving ESSER funds for the first couple of years to help us pay for those costs of the program, allowing us to keep the gen ed revenue in the unreserved general fund for other purposes. Now, will it be 350,000 or 300,000? I don't know that yet. Um, it was just a staff to reserve some money just in case we needed it for that. I just, this doesn't sound, it sounds absurd to me this whole thing. It was supposed to sign, pay its own way. Now we're stashing COVID ESSER funds or whatever to go and put this thing on, but it isn't, and we're going to try to play accounting games to get the money back another way. I, I just don't understand it. I'm lost on it. I don't really like it. I mean, I don't bring up a good point there. Um, you had me until you said, well, we're going to just div div divvy up the cost. Well, every student comes with it. A, 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 so that dollar's got to come no matter what. So I don't know what what we're giving up because if they get ten thousand five hundred per kid from one school, maybe is every school different that they're paying that for the A D M? But it should be one hundred percent A D M. Where they're also just not paying G C E. Neither paying a portion based upon the number of students they have there. So I agree with I think. Confused too as to why are we dividing up the cost when we know what the, the dollars are per student coming in? Yeah, they're coming into us. So either way, we either have to pay them the full ADM back or we pay them a share of the cost because the, the money is coming to us. So we got to get it to them somehow. So it comes to us and it goes back. We back. We pay them. We pay them. So what happens if their we, costs are above that ADM? The agreement with the member districts right now is we will pay the above costs, but we'll also pay the below cost if it comes in below the ADM. So who's the board? Their board's monitoring what their costs are. Yes. And you're monitoring both costs, both books for us and GCED. Trying to, yes. 
Can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, because that just kind of what he was talking about, um, getting money for students, even if they go over to the five rivers. Mm -hmm. Now, since out of three, mm -hmm. um, children in the district, they also we also get money for them for them being Native American, don't we too? Or because that's why I have to sign up paperwork when they first yes. enter the district, right? Well, um, well, I mean, I just had to do it again. No, when they would go, that they would now count on GCEB's Mars file as Native American. And so not Red Wing Public District, mm -hmm. right? So GCEB gets that portion of it, but Red Wing still gets. Red, uh, GCD does not have enough students yet to qualify for Native American funding. Okay. But Red Wing would get the, the state money. Mm -hmm. But not the federal. Correct. Not so where does the federal American. go? Huh? Where does the federal go then? We just don't get that allocation the federal feds keep it. You know what I think would be really helpful maybe at the well the next board meeting or the next finance committee meeting or both would be to have like a rough um, estimate showing how the revenues are coming in, like the Red Wing and how the costs are, yeah. are allocated, because I think that would answer a lot of the questions. Yeah. And, and it's it's quite complicated because the revenue coming in may not be new revenue for us, because it may be students who were here last year who are now over there. So that's why we're, we're putting money aside for what could be an increased cost. The only way it comes out cost neutral is if it's a new student or a student we read, uh, student we brought back from online school that we're now getting the aid for. And I think that's a good point. I ask you to bring it back there because I don't want to all of a sudden pay a bill we don't know what we're going to be paying. Mm -hmm. Right. Because all of a sudden, oh, we need this much money because we, whatever. I, I, we, we, we budget ours, so let's figure yeah. out what their budget is. Yeah, and, and they, have, they have budgets prepared for different levels of students. We're just if it's okay with the finance chair to bring it back that it is okay and also from the gcd chair perspective i mean like, like not the chair of that but like representative for us um it's complex yet for me to simplify it somehow we have to pay for the students over there mm -hmm. from red Wing. so whether we pay directly from the general fund or we put money over into the ESSER funds or save money that way. Either way, we have to pay for our kids to go over there. It doesn't, yeah, it just doesn't like, it's not in their backpack when they go there. Like, here's my, you know, 10 grand. But we get 10, let's say we get 10,000, all of a sudden we get billed for 13. For over right. There. So that's, that's what, unexpected. It is unexpected. And that's um, something that the board is supposed to be, when I talked about earlier, adding another teacher. Is it going to be worth the benefit if we ask the outside districts or we allow outside districts to come in? So it's it's an unknown, but I'm glad that you want to bring it back to the finance committee so that we stay on top of it. Kind of like maybe another spreadsheet like we're doing with how we're spending our budget. Our kind budget. of also tracking that's okay. Does that help you out there? No, I'm gonna go and say it again if I get a chance. No, let's let Sherry talk. Okay. Sherry's on the call and yeah. she would like to try, try to explain it. Go ahead, Sherry. Good evening, everyone. Um, I will give it a shot. So as Jackie mentioned, an education district cannot receive general education revenue. So any student we enroll, that revenue goes to their resident district, not where they may have been open enrolled, but to their resident district. So for instance, if you had students open enrolled to another one of my members, and now if they're enrolled in 5RO, that um, revenue is going to come back to you. Um, just a little aside, I do think we're at the right number for Native American uh, to capture that money as of today. So I just add that in. Um, so uh, today we ended our first day. Um, we ended with 134 students, um, 94 of which are secondary, uh, 41 um, are elementary. Um, I don't know what the number <clears throat> will be tomorrow. It has been a very busy day. So um, with all of my districts receive a different amount of revenue per child because it's based on their tax 
capacity in their districts, their referendums, all of those other factors, and maybe even what programs they might qualify for based on free and reduced and other pieces. Um, but based on the low estimate we chose um, for that ADM, we would bring in about 1.1 million. Um, our expenses right now are about 750,000. So there'd be 355,000 back that would then go back um, to my members. So we are providing this program. Um, how I'm really trying to explain it to staff is it's not as if you are sending your students away. It's as if you have another high school and another elementary option for your own students. They're still your students. They're still my students. Um, it's just another option for them. My member districts, um, those um, students are being educated at cost. Um, so there's no, um, the only administrator cost on that program is our principal cost. So it is strictly at cost. If we have um, students from outside our membership, outside of the joint powers agreement, um, we would retain the full ADM for them. So there's a balance um, because we want to make sure we have room for any students within um, our county. Um, but we also want to make this um, a feasible and um, efficient. And um, so I hope that that helps. We can't, if we were an independent school district and they enrolled with us, the general ed revenue would come straight to us. Um, because it doesn't, it goes to the member districts. We're billing, which Jackie's doing instead of us billing that and taking it out of your general fund. For two years, she's able to cover that cost with your ESSER and help your general ed fund budget. I don't know if that helped or hurt, but I gave it a shot. Thank you, Sherry. <laughs> Can I give it one more shot? Let's suppose that I made up numbers, but if, if Red Wing was receiving $800,000, for the students from Red Wing who were in that program, and our share of the expenses was eight hundred thousand, so it was exactly even. We're just accessing another three hundred fifty thousand from the government, federal government, to pay those costs. So that's why it actually helps the general fund uh, by allocating it to, to the Five Rivers Online Program. My turn. Then. Please. So are we double dipping or aren't we? The bottom line is, if we have, say, 80 students out, we have X number of need for X number of less teachers, our expenses go down. The way Sherry explained it, what they're shooting for is that it costs less to educate the children that are enrolled in that, or students that are enrolled in the program than what they're going to get back. So what we're trying to do is convert uh, $650,000 to the general fund using this terminology, we should be reducing staff in our district and doing other things, and we should find other uses for the $650,000 for ESSER funds. And I'll, if I could respond. Maybe it could be used to play for that pay, playground at the bluff, but I still think because we're at elementary under this COVID thing, it might, but I'm not an expert. There's got to be other places. So, or are you just trying to find a place to park $650,000 so you can get it from the government and you don't have any use for it? Well, I'll, and I'll respond in two ways. First, you know, there's a difference between the fixed costs and variable costs. You know, if there are two first graders who've chosen online, we're not going to reduce any costs within our district. So, and that would be true for almost all of this. You know, regardless, Five Rivers Online will have, we'll have the teachers to them, you know, those kinds of things, but we're not able to cut costs dollar for dollar just because of the, the numbers. So uh, that's the first one. In terms of what you're saying as far as a playground, uh, if we're able to use that ESSER funds to pay for this online cost, then that frees up money in the general fund that we put towards the fund balance. We could pay the, the playground. We could uh, hire another counselor, we could do all sorts of things, um, you know, but it gives us the most flexibility. That's fine. I, I put my point out there. If we have less students in our district because they're in this program, then we should have less expenses. Things should work its way through. It's been presented. It's going to cost less. I see 650000 going out through ESSER money. Where are we going to find the money after ESSER is not here then? Let's be realistic about what we're saying it's going to cost us. $300,000 a year to 
cab fiber was on my option available through that district. Let's say it, let's go up front and say that's the way it is. Yeah, the, the one thing though is that a lot of these kids, if we did not have Five Rivers online, they'll go to another uh, another mm -hmm. online school. I definitely would have, and I'm on school board. Yep. Then you wouldn't be paying three hundred thousand dollars a year extra besides. We'd be losing a lot of state aid if, if they chose to go elsewhere. I guess I never learned how to manage money properly in my life. I'm sorry. Oh, I just don't no. understand this here. It doesn't make sense. So I've said my part. I think it's time for me to quit. I do think the finance committee could look at a really simple chart and doesn't, you know, maybe no one will change their minds if it's the right use or not, but at least it would be, you know, easier for, for Jackie to explain to all of us, you know, um, you know if we actually saw the numbers and how the proportions were. Kind of Can I just make a comment? Please. We have never been good. I'm sorry. Some of you may have skated through this district and had a great old time and great memories, but a majority of the people have not. So saying that we need to be taking money from kids because we're we have kids in five rivers. No, actually we should be putting more money into this district to make us better and change. Not because of things don't line up in the finance. For anything great to get going and started, you're going to have to put a little bit of money to it and then just see how it goes from there. And then probably maybe prof hopefully profit from the benefit of the outcome later on. But I have a really huge problem thinking that we were good before and returning to normal and say, and taking more money from the students. No. If I have to come in and do free labor here, that's exactly what I'm going to be doing so we can get past this. Oh, look at this. Uh, yes, I, I think it is confusing. I mean, this is, it sounds very complicated and confusing. If, if we could simplify it a little bit for us, that would be really great. But I think, yeah, and I'm just going to add, I think, you, you know, maybe you're right. It costs money to educate children. It's not widgets for widgets. It, it never has been. So, however the money is being done by our finance person. Now we all know, and now it's a conversation we can continue to have about what works best. I think but, we also, sorry, Oh, I was gonna say, we're not throwing stones on any particular situation or system that we have in place today. I think it's, an, we're finding out the information and the finance committee can look at it, but education is expensive and to do it well, it's going to cost money and to meet the needs of all of our children, it's going to take online school for some kids. Yes, Jennifer. I was just going to say, and also, I think we need to keep in mind that ASTRA funds can only be spent on certain things, and there are certain parameters, and our Five Rivers Online is one way that that money can be spent, but we are getting the ADM that can go in the general fund that, that can be spent on something else. So it's not that it's, did I kind of say that correctly? Um, so it's not that it's we're spending more, <laughs> we're spending the right amount to make sure that we have those five rivers and using this the asset fund source that we have. Um, I, I just think that's the key here, that these are, are the funds that need to be spent on five rivers. But we, yes, we are still getting money for the students that are in the program. And we can look at this as the finance. Maybe we we'll want to add some things to 2022 and other Categories in 23 24 to spread that out. It doesn't have to be done in a two year span. We have three years to spend it or to utilize it, I should say. And, and then, then, I mean, you may want, we may want to look at this as a group to see how we could uh, maybe culturally relevant text K through 12 instead of spending 215 one year, you may want to spend it out over two, three years to get more bang for it. Uh, I'm just throwing one out there as an option. So I, I think we as a finance may have to have a conversation about that and look at it going forward. And uh, just to note that in in order for it to be in the application, it has to have come out as a need in our needs assessment. Right. So we need to take that into account when we're looking at how well, we're spending these Communication things. manager, we only have two years. We, we need it for the third year, too. So, that's a need. so I'm just throwing it. I'm not here to convolute, convolute uh, the discussion, just saying we need to look at it. Mm -hmm. Next time. Okay. Thank you. 
Uh, next item on our business items is identify official with authority. And each year we need to uh, uh, identify one person to serve as the Iowa uh, identified official with authority. Uh, and that in districts is typically uh, the superintendent. And so that gives me the authority to assign responsibilities to others in terms of reporting for state and federal programs. So for example, let's say Iowa, um, I authorize Jen Grove to be responsible for submitting the Title I application. I grant uh, Jackie authority to approve all sorts of things, probably 10 or 15 different items. So it's a formality. Any questions? Somebody's laughing at the state because they purposely made that acronym. Mm -hmm. Iowa. Mm -hmm. All right, so the recommendation is to approve Karsten Anderson as the identified official with authority and Lisa Segura as the Iowa to add and remove names only for Red Wing School District 25601. Do I have a motion? Oh, motion made by Holly. I need a second. I'll second it. Arlen, any other discussion? All those in favor, say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? All right, motion carries. Uh, upcoming meetings and future topics, um, those are listed in our board book. I do want to point out that um, the committee meetings are actually old from last school year, so I will make sure those get updated for the next agenda package. Uh, our next school board meeting will be on the 20th of September, right here in this place. And then we'll have that open forum on Je at Jefferson on September 27th, along with some committee meetings that we have. Is there a committee meeting on the 20th? Uh, I believe the personnel meeting, personnel? Uh, personnel, okay. and legislative and policy. Okay. Finance is that? The last, the 27th. Yeah, yep. are we gonna have that at Jefferson? Yeah, we'll need to. Okay. So if that's at 445, maybe we can have a tour kind of happening at the same time. How do we set up all the technology at Jefferson? Uh, we have internet access there. So Kevin says we can still oh, do it there. Awesome. Okay. We're gonna verify that before we do. Okay. All right, anything else on upcoming meetings or future topics? All right, then I will look for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Motion made by Jim, seconded by Holly. All those in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? All right, we're adjourned, Dave. Thank you. I thought you were going to hold that. What? I thought you were going to hold that. You found